Welcome to the Art of Precision on Gillette World Sport. We're in Olympic mode today as we look at the evolution of the Winter Games. Drop in for a training camp with Team USA's freestylers. And talk luge with world champion Wolfgang Kindl. At the moment you're sitting on the start, the focus is 100% on what you're doing. First up on Gillette World Sport, we hit the slopes with Team USA's free skiers and snowboarders in preparation for Pyeongchang 2018. The US team is a, uh, we're diverse. Like we have young guns and we have some old veterans and uh, I, I'm kind of in the midpoint. And it's interesting because these young guys have so much energy and they are always push, 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 push. The older guys, you know, they really pick their days that they want to try to like fire off and learn something new. You try to use the young bucks energy and motivate you and get you going, but then you try to be smart like the veterans. Each day I'm still learning, you know, and looking at the young guys and being like, how do I keep that mentality of being hungry? We have such unique personalities and people with such different backgrounds that it really creates an inspiring place to train and to get better at skiing. We all have a good time together. We're all super tight-knit, everybody gets along, uh, everybody argues, probably as much as I see my family, so, uh, which isn't very often. Everyone's learning from everyone, no matter what your age is, and that's something that the U.S. team has said. I don't think many other teams have. We work together the best that we can from the development side of things all the way up to the, the top, top pros, and that sort of dynamic helps us pass down that legacy of of success and professionalism to the younger athletes as well. Bobby Brown is definitely one of the, the top, top guys. He's super professional, on point. He's also very methodical in how he operates. That's why he's had such a successful career. Ryan Stasel's from Alaska originally, so he's uh, definitely got that kind of Wild West spirit. Chris Corning is a, one of our younger athletes on the team. He's the first American to ever do a quad core. He wants to get that trick to the snow in Korea. We're all working together to support this team the best that we can. There's a lot of moving parts. And at the same time, we want to keep things fun because that's what snowboarding and free skiing is, is really about. It's, it's having fun. Pretty much the game plan's progression. As an athlete, I have tricks that I, I know that I can do and that I want to do. And so it just kind of comes down to being comfortable. We have a lot of equipment that we bring up to help with this progression. The cameras are very important so that we can do video review, not only after the training is, is over, but during the training we have a, a Wi-Fi system that's able to shoot the clips directly up to the start so that the coaches can see what's going on in the landings and down the course. Uh, and also the athletes can take a minute to stop and review what they're doing and, and the coaches can discuss with them you know, what they need to do better. Everybody's watching, all eyes are on you, you know, to help you out, try and learn a new trick, or if you're just having trouble with a trick, the video, you can go up and look at it, and it really helps on, you know, figuring out what you're doing wrong, or, you know, if it was good, you know what to do again. Our team coaches are pretty much like the elite, I say. When you're in the zone and really trying to learn a new trick, they know exactly what to say, they show you what you need to know, and just get it done. I, I don't think there's a day that goes by when I'm on my snowboard that I'm not at least scared once. You know, once I feel that fear, you get that kind of like that tingle inside and that nerve wracking feeling and you can kind of turn that to like this determination and this like drive. Our qualification process, we try to keep it really fair. We have a series of four to five events in the winter time, and we actually don't name our team until right before the Olympic Games. And the reason we do that is because we don't want people to qualify early and slow down. We want them to stay sharp, stay pushing. We want them to be at the top of their game when it comes time to get on that airplane to Korea and bring home those medals. 
The Olympic qualifiers are crazy and the best four Americans go, but the American field is just so deep with free skiing. Just to make the team is just a win. Everyone that is announced, you know that they are the top athletes of the U.S. at that moment in time. My preparations, I think, are pretty good. I don't really know, though, because I've never gone, so I don't really know what it takes. I'm just kind of going by the seat of my pants and seeing what happens and, you know, trying to do the best I can and, you know, feel comfortable on the snowboard. I haven't really been in the contest scene for too long. You know, it's all happened really fast. I didn't expect this to be in this position at all right now. When I went to the Olympics, I didn't do as well as I would have wanted, but just to make it there was an amazing thing. And, you know, after I didn't get the results I wanted to, and I was kind of bummed, and I'm like, yeah, dude, whatever, it's the Olympics, who cares? You know, honestly, and then, you know, a year later, I'm like, I was on the U.S. Olympic team. Like, that's a pretty special thing, and to see it kind of come full circle, be in the position I am four years later and have a chance to go back is, is pretty crazy. And, you know, the week after the Olympics, I didn't think that I'd be right here right now trying to gear up for another Olympic go. You know, words just can't describe it. Let's do it! You get to represent your country on the biggest stage. This is a title I'll be able to hold for the rest of my life. There's not many people in the world get to say that they're an Olympian. We've had some great success over the years at the Olympic Games, but, you know, it gets more and more difficult every time. All we can do is do what we can do to prepare ourselves. We're not looking at our competition. We're really looking to set the bar, and we're ready for anything. Time now for a look at what other medal hopefuls have been up to as they prepare for the Winter Olympics. Norway topped the overall podium four years ago in Sochi. To repeat their success, they'll be hoping for gold from the likes of cross-country skier Johannes Klabo and alpine skier Henrik Kristofferson, who took time out from training to take a ride on his motorbike. The man to beat on the slopes, however, looks likely to be Marcel Herscher, who topped the World Cup standings for a sixth time in 2017. Canadian Justin Cripps showed the raw power required for the two-man bobsled as he made light work of over 200 kilos. Whilst fellow countrymen and 2014 Olympic silver medalist Eric Radford swapped figure skating for flying as he jumped into the cockpit while in Spain. After they beat Canada to win the World Championships last May, Sweden's national ice hockey team will be hoping to replicate their success with their first Olympic gold since 2006. Double speed skating world champion Kiel Neisch swapped skates for rollerblades as he freestyled at a skate park in the Netherlands. Whilst Frenchman Martin Fourcade also didn't let a lack of snow stand in the way of his biathlon training during the summer. And finally, one of the game's biggest names, snowboarder Sean White, secured his place in South Korea, scoring a perfect 100 to win at the U.S. Grand Prix in January. Now we take a trip through time as we track the evolution of the Winter Games from their conception all the way up to the present day. First modern Olympics were held in Greece, the birthplace of the ancient Olympic Games. Fourteen years later, winter sports were contested for the first time in four figure skating events. When the Olympics resumed after the First World War, figure skating wasn't the only winter sport, as ice hockey joined the lineup. An experimental week of winter sports was held in Chamonix, France, ahead of the Paris Summer Games. Featuring more than 250 athletes, it was deemed a success and retrospectively designated the first official Winter Olympic Games. The second Winter Games in Switzerland saw the home team sweep the board in the new demonstration sport of ski joring. But when the third edition moved across the Atlantic, the horses were gone, with dog sled racing making a debut instead. In 1936, the Winter and Summer Games were held in the same country for the final time. Whilst the first post-war game saw St. Moritz become the first city to host a Winter Olympics twice. The 1952 torch relay was performed solely on skis. And a record 30 nations took part in the first Italian edition. Sports television coverage took steps forward in the 1960 slalom when race officials requested a tape from TV producers to check whether an athlete had missed a gate or not, a precursor to the instant replay as we know it today. 
Warm weather caused a lack of snow during the next games in Innsbruck, with the Austrian army drafted in to transport extra snow and ice to competition venues. 1968 were the first winter games to be broadcast on TV in color. And in Sapporo, ski jumper Yuki Okasaya claimed Japan's first ever winter gold medal on home soil. He was subsequently chosen as Japan's flag bearer at the opening ceremony of the next games, where two cauldrons were lit to signify the second time Innsbruck had hosted. Returning to Lake Placid at the height of the Cold War, USA's ice hockey team beat favorites and reigning champions the Soviet Union in what would become known as the Miracle on Ice. Another iconic moment four years later saw British ice dancers Jane Torville and Christopher Dean achieving the only ever perfect score for artistic impression. Speed skating events were held indoors for the first time in Canada. Whilst outdoors in 1988 and again in 1992, ski ballet was contested as a demonstration sport. These games were also the last to be held in the same year as the Summer Games. And so the next edition was held only two years later in Lillehammer. The Nagano Games were the first to feature more than 2,000 athletes and welcomed snowboarding as a new discipline in giant slalom and halfpipe. The next century saw Stephen Bradbury become the first gold medalist for Australia. And in 2006, a record 80 National Olympic Committees entered athletes to compete as Italy hosted its second edition. Canada hosted for a third time before a new home was chosen as Russia hosted its first game. Here, a record 2,800 participants from 88 countries competed including Norwegian biathlete Ola Einar Bjorndalen, who became the most decorated Winter Olympic athlete in history with 13 medals. This year, 102 gold medals, the most ever contested, will be up for grabs when the torch relay reaches its destination in South Korea for the 23rd edition of the Winter Olympics. Still to come, we take to the track with Luge World Champion Wolfgang Kindle and break down some of the crucial elements involved in winter sports. Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Coming up, some of the world's best talk speed, power, and precision. And we get set for Pyeongchang with Australia's Jared Hughes. Now we're on track and hitting speeds of over 130 kilometers per hour with the current Luge World Champion. I'm Wolfgang Kindl from Austria. I'm 29 years old and I'm doing the Luge. I did a lot of uh, different sports in, in my youth, like skiing, football, tennis, I, I did everything. Then I tried the luge. So at the age of 11 I started. So it was kind of an open day on the track in Eagles. Just three or four curves. And it was really fun. I liked the speed and I started training. And then you go further up and always a little bit more, a little bit faster. And from the hobby to my profession now. Training is really hard. It's a lot of athletic training. Training in the weightlifting room and some technical trainings as well, just for pulling on the start. We start in October on ice, so it's from March to October, just getting your physical strength. The legs are not that important, so you have your upper body really in the focus. Also your back and yeah, the muscles you need for, for the start. Normally you have to be really tall, like 1 meter 90 and 95 kilos would be perfect. It's kind of the opposite to me. <laughs> the taller athletes, they have their advantages uh, on the start. They have more weight to accelerate the, the sled. At my height, you have to train more than others and always keep the focus and then it's possible. If you're scared, you're in the wrong sport, I think. You have to have respect on, on some tracks, but if you're scared, then it's better for you if you quit. <laughs> if you're heavier, you're normally faster. That's why athletes like me, if you're not heavy enough, you can use uh, extra weight, a weight belt, something like this. That makes it kind of equal. That's the opportunity we have. You're riding on the edge. 
So if you have your edge on the sled too sharp, it's slow. If it's not sharp enough, it's also slow because you're skidding. You have to be one part with the sled. And so you can accelerate and find the balance. You have to sometimes look what's happening in front of you. So you have to find the, the line between looking a little bit and make no mistake, but also put your head uh, back as often as possible. I'm really fast on the track and good with the aerodynamic and that makes a difference. The most important uh, thing is the steel, where you are directly on the ice. The outside is like a fiberglass material. You have handles for holding yourself in the sled. It's uh, around 25 kilos, so it, there's a limit of 25, this is maximum, and the minimum of 21. I think this is the smallest sled in the whole World Cup circuit because I'm, I think, the smallest guy. We have tracks like in Whistler, Vancouver, where the Olympic Games have taken place. There we had the top speed of 154. This is the, the world record. 130 from a man start is a normal speed on nearly every track. We have to have every tr a single track in your mind. In hundreds of a second you have to think what to do. You have to react on mistakes and always find the right decision to, to keep the, the sled in its line. At the moment you're sitting on the start, the focus is 100% on what you're doing. You have to be really strong in your mind because sometimes you can train it as hard as you want, uh, but if your head is not working, then for sure then it's difficult to be fast in the track. Kindle capped a successful 2017 season by taking home two golds at the World Luge Championships, setting himself up perfectly for the Winter Olympics. Yeah, this was really one of the, the best moments in my career till now. This was really amazing. Uh, it was one of the favorites for sure on my home track because I know every centimeter of my, my track in Eagles, so everything was perfect. Yeah, I knew that, it, that the the run was really good, but you're sure if you see sign one in, in the finish and I heard the, the whole crowd uh, screaming and everyone was on the track and the feeling to think about it uh, was really, really good. This was really a lot of pressure on, on my shoulders and so I think I can feel comfortable also in this situation in the Olympics uh, because uh, I've been there two times, so this also an advantage because you, you know what's going on. I'm for sure one of the favorites of a medal and so I just want to be myself and I just want to show everyone what I can do and what I can do on this lap. Next, some of the world's most successful winter athletes break down the elements which are crucial to mastering their sport. Precision is really important in slope style because you're sort of having to ditch speed, gain speed, land in certain spots and be technical in all of that. So precision is massive. Power. In alpine skiing, there's a lot of force. So you have to have the power both in the legs, but also the mental power to be able to perform to the level that's about winning. Timing on the takeoff is so important. If you are too early or too late, the jump can be like 5 to 50 meters shorter. Precision is really important in skiing because like, if you go too big or too small, you're really going to get hurt, and so you better be on point. Determination. You have to be determined to be able to perform to the level you want to and not only do it once but repeatedly again and again. Power is really important in, the, in bob flying because power is all you need at the start. You got five seconds to accelerate the sled and after that you got no chance anymore to accelerate any further. Balance in the cross country race. We have so small skis, you have to always hold the balance, especially if the conditions are really hard and um, it's all about balance. Speed has got to be the most important thing in self cell. One, because you need it to clear jumps and you need the right amount to ride rails and not go too fast that so you just nick them or not make it on. The speed is super crucial.
Finally, we check in with Australian snowboarder Jared Hughes as he prepares to go for gold in Pyeongchang. I got into snowboarding through one of my teachers at school who just said I looked like a snowboarder. Australia is really well known for doing summer sports and I don't think growing up anyone would really think about doing a winter sport, especially in this country when it's 30 degrees 60% of the time. I found my way to do it and love it, so now I get to keep doing it. Jared Hughes's rise to snowboarding's world stage began early when he took up the sport at just six years old. By the age of 18, he had made the Australian team for the Winter Olympics in Sochi, and two years later, found himself on the start line of his first X Games final. It is a three-man race for gold. The green of Alex Pullen out in front. The Aussies going one and two with Jared Hughes sitting in second. Keep an eye on the blue, Constantine Shad. It is a drag race to the finish. Aussie, 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 and he brings it home. Jared Hughes, your number one qualifier, getting it done. This is amazing. I was, we are in Germany for a World Cup, and all I could think about was winning gold here. And just so happy it's finally here. With one gold in the bank, Hughes soon set his sights on another at the 2018 Winter Olympics. Despite undergoing five knee surgeries in less than five years, the 22-year-old will arrive in South Korea off the back of a healthy season, which also included victory at the World Cup event in Austria. Not having a surgery during the uh, summer was a big, happy moment for me. Just being one year without knee surgery was massive, and I think it's really put me in a good position going into the game, so I'm really happy. I think the second game's experience is really a good place to go because it's, I think, having that little bit of knowledge from the first games is really going to benefit and not get taken away from the experience of the games. And, you know, we've been there once, now we know what we want to accomplish there, so just enjoy the ride, I guess. I think the goal for the games is definitely to walk away with a medal. Hopefully it's gold, but, uh, you know, you just got to take each step as it comes and go enjoy the journey.